Nicole can, can can join us as we as we get going. So, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for a date with Japan today. For those who who don't know me, I'm Charlie from from Putney Travel. This is the the second of a series of webinars we're doing that highlight some of our very favourite holiday destinations and and the specialist partners we work with there. Today I'm really pleased that we're joined by Matt, um, who's a good friend of ours from, from Inside Japan. We, we've worked closely with Inside Japan since Putney Travel was set up in 2013. And in fact, I've actually worked with them for many years before that as well. They are simply one of the best tour operators around and they've got a great team on the ground in Japan and they are perfectly placed and Matt is perfectly placed to give us a, an insight into this unique and fascinating country. Japan's been in the news a lot recently. We had a great World Cup there, Rugby World Cup there last year and of course there's the Olympics which have now been delayed through to 2021. I was lucky enough to, to revisit Japan last summer uh, with the help of Inside Japan and we had one of the best best holidays, best family holidays ever. Um, hopefully this webinar will give you a bit of a flavour of the country and for when we're all able to go there once again. Uh, without much ado, can I hand you over to Matt? The, the presentation is going to be about 30 minutes or so. There'll be time to ask questions afterwards. Um, however, feel free to use the chat button in the middle of your screen uh, to ask questions as we go along and, I, and I'll try to deal with those. Okay, over to you, Matt. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Um, yeah, as Charlie said, I work for Inside Japan and I hope he doesn't mind. I threw a few family photos of their trip to Japan oh. with us last year. Um, so Charlie is well placed to help you plan a trip to Japan. Um, and my, me, myself, why am I doing this presentation? Um, I lived in a place called Hagi for three years um, as an English teacher in this tiny little um, remote town on the south coast. Um, which was famous for pottery and old samurai streets. Um, and since moving back to the UK in 2009, I then started working for Inside Japan Tours. Um, we consider ourselves to be the true specialists when it comes to Japan. We started in the year 2000. We're now the UK's biggest Japan specialist tour operator. Our head office is in um, Bristol, but we've also got offices in Australia, America and in Japan. I'm just going to show you a little video, hopefully it will work, to give you a bit of inspiration of what you can expect from Japan.
So that's just give you an idea of what it's just a taste of what you can get from Japan. Um, it it is really a spectacular country. You've got your old, you've got your new, you've got your big cities, you've got your rural. It is, it's got something for everyone and it is completely different from any other country in the world. Um, so a little bit going, I've never done this presentation over Zoom before though, so I hope it translates well over the internet because usually I do this in person and I do go through it quite quickly. So I hope it it's not at a too fast a pace. But anyway, a little bit about Japan. Um, it's got six and a half thousand islands. Um, it's about 70% mountainous, so inland it's all mountains and then most people live on the coastline. It's about the same land mass as Germany spread out all over these six and a half thousand islands and there's about 30,000 kilometres of coastline. So there is a lot to explore in Japan. I lived there for three years. I've been working for this company for 11 years. I've still not seen everything I want to see in Japan. So there is a lot to explore. In terms of population, there's 127 million people in Japan. Um, 35 million of those live in Tokyo alone. Um, so half of the UK basically lives in Tokyo, which is a crazy thing to think about. If we look at the different islands of Japan, up north, we've got the island of Hokkaido. This island hasn't been inhabited as much as, uh, as long as the mainland um, has. It's a lot more rural and sparse, so you haven't got the same depth of culture up here. You've got um, great winter sports, you've got great wildlife, bird life, um, and in the summer you've got beautiful national parks, rolling mountains and hills, but it hasn't got the same depth of culture as mainland, it hasn't got the big shrines and temples, it hasn't got the big things that you want to tick off when you want to see Japan, it's more of the big outdoors and being really rural, so most people don't make it up here for a first trip to Japan unless they're going to see the wildlife or they're going skiing or snowboarding. Then you've got the mainland Honshu, which is Tokyo, Mount Fuji, Kyoto, Hiroshima. This is where most people would do their first time trip to Japan. And this is what I'm going to focus on later in this in this presentation. And then you've got Shikoku, um, which is the fourth largest island. And that's literally what it means, fourth country. That's what it translates into English. Um, and again, very rural, vine bridges, valleys, um, ravines, um, most people wouldn't go here for a first time trip but it is a good place to go if you're looking for something a bit off the beaten track and different so it is accessible from the mainland by bridge. Then we got the seven island of Kyushu which is the bullet train runs from Tokyo all the way down to the south of this island so it is accessible by train. Um, Again, quite rural, you've got Nagasaki where the um, second atomic bomb was dropped and Nagasaki is, was one of, at one point one of the only ports open to the outside world. So it's got a lot of Dutch and Chinese influence, so a very different feel to other parts of Japan. Um, you've got lots of volcanoes on this island and hot spring resorts and ancient forests. So again, most people wouldn't go down here on a first time trip to Japan, but it is accessible if you do want to do something a little bit different. And then going down south, so down closer towards Taiwan are the islands of Okinawa. Uh, these are subtropical islands and at one point they were their own separate kingdom to Japan called the Ryukyu Kingdom. It's got um, a lot of its architecture and, and sort of culture is a mix of Japanese and Chinese um, and it's got a very different feel to mainland Japan. Um, so yeah, there's lots and lots of islands to explore down here. You've got beautiful tropical beaches, you've got diving, um, the main land I would probably, I know we've got somebody on the call tonight who's interested in Okinawa, which is why I'll go into this a little bit more detail. Um, the mainland, the bigger, biggest island called Okinawa Honto, um, that's got lots of war history and it's got, um, it did have an, a castle which unfortunately, unfortunately burnt down at the end of that 
or was it at the start of this year or end of last mm -hmm. year, which they're hoping to rebuild. Um, but we don't tend to recommend customers go into the main island unless they're interested in the war history there, mainly because there's a big American air base there. It's quite Americanized. Um, and we prefer sending customers to the more remote islands to really get into island life and um, where there's no big cities and it is really laid back. Um, one thing I would say about Okinawa is that you've got to you've got you've got to be careful you can't expect it to be like beach resorts that you find elsewhere in Asia it is still very Japanese they have rules about when you can swim and can't swim where you can swim where you can't swim um, and also um, uh, it's not got the beach culture that other destinations in Asia have like um, uh, Thailand and Vietnam so you, you can't just sort of wander down the beach and stumble across beach bars and things like that everything's very much in its resort so um, it's an, a fantastic place to visit it's it's a very different experience to a mainland Japan um, but you've got to be careful that it, it might not have the expectations of the beach resorts you get elsewhere in Asia and um, it can add a considerable cost to the trip and um, the accommodation in Okinawa is um, quite expensive um, and getting the flights down and back so it can add a considerable cost to your trip if you do decide to go down to Okinawa but it's great if you want to do island hopping and really see a different side to Japan um, you could do maybe nine nights on the main island up at uh, Tokyo, Mount Fuji, Kyoto, and then a few nights down in Okinawa if you want to do it, something like that. But again, most people wouldn't go here on a first time trip to Japan. It's more a second time trip to Japan unless you're looking for something different. So why would you choose Japan? Um, well, I'd start off by saying that Japan is unique and you've got these big iconic things, sumo, samurai, Mount Fuji, bullet train, geisha. And whilst all of these things are fantastic, I don't think this is what makes up the mem memories from Japan. You will certainly enjoy all of these things, but I reckon it's all the little things that Japan does differently that you're really going to enjoy. Um, so uh, I would so. You can see a taxi there. Taxi doors actually open automatically for you in Japan and then they close automatically behind you. Um, so taking a taxi is a real experience. When I moved back to the UK, I kept forgetting to close taxi doors behind me. Um, and you'll see the seats inside the taxi are covered in lace. The drivers will be wearing a suit with a hat and white gloves. So taking a taxi is an experience. Then you've got um, the bullet trains. The picture you can see here is the staff who've just cleaned the bullet train. They've left the bullet train and now they're bowing to everyone who's going on the train who are all in an orderly queue waiting to go on. Ticket conductors will bow um, when they're entering and leaving a carriage and say thank you and excuse me for disturbing you. Um, toilets are a great experience in Japan. You've got really, really high tech toilets um, with lots of buttons um, which shoot jets of water, heated toilet seats, um, and the public toilets also have buttons that you can press to play music or a waterfall sound so that people around you can't hear what you whilst you're doing your business in there. So, um, yeah, but then on complete contrast a lot of um, traditional bars and restaurants will just have a hole in the floor as a toilet so it's complete contrast nothing being high tech or low tech and nothing in between um, and that's quite interesting with Japan people think of it as being a very high tech country but actually we still make a lot of our bookings by fax in Japan even though they are high tech so um, it's, it's a big contrast in Japan of all of these things and you'll see there there's toilet slippers um, in bars and restaurants, you change from your shoes into toilet slippers so that you're not spreading germs from inside and outside the toilet, um, which is a really unusual thing to do. But um, once you've had a few beers, sometimes you forget to change back into your other shoes, um, which can be quite embarrassing, but they find it really, really funny. Um, and then you've got big, exciting cities like Tokyo and Osaka. Um, but as I said earlier, 70% of the country is um, mountainous. So you've got beauty, beautiful landscapes all throughout the country. The food is amazing. Um, it's not just fish and sushi. 
um, you could go to Japan for two weeks and eat a different meal for every meal that you have each day and still not have experienced all the different cuisine it's got. When I go back to Japan, I really need to plan my trips that I know I get all my favorite foods fitted in within that two week period. And then you've got amazing wildlife, you've got your snow monkeys, you've got tame deer that wander around shrines and temples, flying squirrels, the cranes, um, stellar sea eagles, great wildlife all over Japan, beautiful gardens throughout the country, wherever you go, even just uh, uh, somebody's front garden will be spectacular. And then you've got your hot spring baths. Japan is a very volcanic country, so there's hot spring baths all over the destination. And going to the hot spring bath is a way of life in Japan. You probably go to your local hot spring about once a week. Um, it's not for everyone. It, if you go to the public hot springs, it is communal. Um, usually men and women are separate, um, but you do have to go in completely naked. So it's not for everyone. Um, you do get a little modesty towel that you can carry around with you. Um, but uh, yeah, you've got to be quite brave um, and, and, and just, just, just get in there and do it. But there are ways of getting around being naked in public if you, if you are a bit shy, and I'll go into that later. Then a lot of people don't think of Japan as an outdoors destination, but you've got hiking, cycling, and it's a great outdoors. So it's good to mix the outdoors with all the shrines and temples and cities. Otherwise, you might get a bit tired of all the shrines and, shrines and temple, temples after um, a couple of weeks in Japan. Then beautiful art. Japan is known for its traditional art, but then there's also great modern art in Japan. That pumpkin there is on an island called Naoshima, which is an island dedicated solely to modern art. And there's great um, art installations all over the island. Um, one of the museums has got work by Monet and lots of great famous artists. So if you're into your art, there is lots to see and do in Japan. And then you've got your pop culture, um, manga, anime, cartoons, video games. This is all throughout Japan. So especially if you're traveling with kids, you will see cute characters all over the country and there's loads to keep kids entertained. But what I'd say is the most, um, the most, uh, it, the best thing about Japan is the people, the it, they've got the warmest of welcomes. They're so proud of their destination. They want to make, make you in love it as much as they do and I was there for the Rugby World Cup in October and the atmosphere was just absolutely amazing they were so happy to be welcoming so many different people from all over the world um, and yeah it, it, it was just brilliant so the welcome you'll receive in Japan will be outstanding. Who is Japan for? I'd literally say it's for anybody it can be for solo travellers, for families, couples, literally anyone and the main reason it's for anyone is that it's very very safe you'll quite often see kids like this walking home from school by themselves one of the lowest crime rates in the world um, and actually for solo travelers as well it's quite normal to go out and eat in restaurants um, by yourself they'll have counters where you can sit by by yourself or talk to the staff who are standing behind the the counter um, so Traveling around Japan by yourself, it's safe. Going out for eating meals by yourself, it's not considered weird or anything like that. It's actually quite normal in Japan. So yeah, I'd say Japan is suitable for everyone. When's the best time to go? You've got the cherry blossoms, which happen in spring. So I'd say on the main island, if you go on a two week trip, either the last week of March into the first two weeks of April, and it's a varied trip between mountains and cities and rural and countryside, you're probably going to see the cherry blossoms. So the last week of March, first two weeks of April on the main island. Um, other parts of the country, obviously, they differ according to the temperature. Um, but they were a little bit early this year, so they, they tended to be in full bloom around the 25th of March this year. Um, but yes, it's really popular time to go but it is also an expensive time to go and the busiest time to go it's busy with japanese tourists as well as foreign tourists and next year obviously with covid and what's what's be happening in the world right now um that hits right in the middle of cherry blossom so everybody who was meant to go in this year have probably rebooked to be going next year. So I think next year's cherry blossom is going to be um, a really, really busy time. So if you are thinking about going next year, it's worth planning well in advance, I would think. 
Um, and then we got summer, so June to September. Summer is actually really hot and humid in Japan. Um, Charlie, did you go in summer? Yeah, we were there at the end of August and, and it, it was hot. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, but you know, that, that, did it stop us doing anything? Not really, <laughs> not at all. Um, and we had the cold noodles at, at lunchtime, which, which were a fantastic way of, of, of cooling down. So yeah, it is hot and humid, um, but every town will have its own summer festival during the summer, fireworks festivals, people wear uh, yukata, which are the summer kimono. So it's got quite a nice atmosphere in the summer, but you've got, got to be happy to be going around in the heat all day. Then autumn is, I would say, just as beautiful as the cherry blossoms. You've got really beautiful colours all over the mountains, all over the shrines and temples. So I actually prefer autumn. This is my favourite season to be in Japan. Slightly later than we have autumn here. So if you want to hit the peak autumn leaves, um, I'd say uh, early to mid-November is the best time to be going. Um, but the autumn leaves period is a lot longer than cherry blossom. Cherry blossom, they'll be in bloom for about a week, a week or so, and then they've gone. Whereas the autumn leaves, it's a much longer period. So late October, right through to early December, you've got the autumn leaves on the main island. So because you haven't got the compact two weeks of the cherry blossom craziness, it's actually still busy at that time of year, but not as crazy busy as the cherry blossoms. And then you've got winter, December through to February. It's cold, but a nice crisp cold, beautiful wintry landscapes and taking a hot spring bath in winter is, is great. So um, not everyone tends, it's quite a quiet season actually for, uh, for, for people traveling from abroad to Japan, but I think it's a great time to go if you don't mind wrapping up warm during the days. Getting there, um, BA, Japan Airlines or ANA, um, fly direct from London. Um, flight time is around 12 hours. Um, so they go into two airports in Narita, um, in Tokyo, sorry. Um, and then there's currently, there is a BA flight from Osaka direct as well from London. Who knows after um, the COVID situation if they'll still have daily flights or if they will cut any back. But I would imagine the BA flights, Japan Airlines and ANA flights into Tokyo will keep going just because of the business routes between Tokyo and London. Um, but maybe the Osaka flight might not make it. Um, uh, and you can go indirect with Finnair, Air France, KLM. Again, they're good options. It's usually around um, 14 hours with a connection in the, in the middle. Um, Emirates is also a very cheap option, but the flight time's around 19 hours, so I just do not recommend that with a change in Dubai. It's just far, far too long. Getting around Japan, um, there's lots of trains across the country. Public transport is amazing. It works like clockwork, so you would predominantly be using the trains when you're in Japan. And we give you an IC card, which is like an Oyster card in London, so that you can tap in and out of all of the... Um, all of the subways in Tokyo and other cities as well. Um, we can organize private transfers in Japan, um, but I'd say we don't use them as much as you would elsewhere in, in, in um, Asia. We can arrange private cars for you to get between your hotel and your station and things like that, but it's really, really expensive. So for example, a, a private transfer between your hotel and the train station in Tokyo could cost you 70, 80, a hundred pounds if we plan it in advance if you jump in a taxi on the day it'll cost you 10 to 15 pounds so i'd i'd say it's much better jumping in a taxi on the day than having it all arranged in advance um and you're never going to get ripped off by taxi drivers it's always on the meter so it's it's very easy to do when you're in there and here's a little guide from one of our um our tour leaders uh brett about getting around japan and tokyo I'm not getting any sound on that. Uh, no sound. And there's no sound. I'm not, I'm not getting any sound. No. Okay, we'll skip that. We'll skip that then. Uh, sorry about that. Did you have the sound for the video earlier? Ah. No, no. I didn't. 
it's because I forgot to click a button. That's why. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, so yeah, um, moving on to accommodation. Um, uh, yeah, you've got great, fantastic Western style hotels all across the country. Um, one thing I would say about the Western style hotels is that the rooms are a bit smaller there than you would expect elsewhere in the world. Um, but yeah, I'd recommend Western style hotel for the big cities. Um, just because you're going to be out exploring all day, you don't really want to be spending lots of money on a fantastic accommodation if you're not going to be using it that much. So we say Western style hotels when you're in big cities. And then when you're out in the countryside and you're, there's not much to do in the evenings, that's when you splash out and maybe go for a traditional inn, a Rio Can, um, where you enjoy an evening meal. They've got hot spring baths and it is really a, a great experience. Um, and I'll go into this later. Then you've got Minshuku, which are more family run, smaller little inns. They're a bit like bed, bed and breakfast, but a bit more basic. And then you've got Shukubo, which are temple lodgings. So it's just like a traditional inn, but they're attached to a temple. You can get up in the morning and um, do uh, uh, morning prayers with the monks. Um, one thing about the traditional accommodation in Japan is that meals are included. Um, and the Japanese are not very good at dietary requirements. Um, not many people have allergies in Japan. Everything, everybody eats everything. The concept of vegetarianism or veganism, not a thing in Japan. Um, so if you do have any dietary requirements, you need to let Charlie know in advance um, so that when we're choosing the accommodation for you, these traditional inns, we know exactly what inn does what dietary requirement in advance um, so it is quite complicated so let us Charlie know in advance and we can sort that out for you because not all inns deal with all different uh, dietary requirements then you've got Matt, so what, uh, with, Matt what I would, what I would yep. just add to that though, is that you guys you know when you get it right I mean whoever has complicated dietary things they're always sorted and it works brilliantly I appreciate you know you you, you know and, and you, you produce labels for signs for people to show in restaurants and stuff like that so it, it does actually the Japanese take it very seriously yeah and it, like, like it is complicated but as long as we know in advance it's no problem it's just if we find out as the day you arrive in Japan that's when it gets prob problematic um, even for customers who uh, are gluten-free we send a bottle of gluten-free soy sauce to your first hotel so you can carry it around Japan with you so you can have your sushi so um, yeah there's lots we can do and then we've got uh, matcha which are traditional inns uh, traditional townhouses which have been renovated and you have the entire place to yourself or cap Capsule hotels, which um, aren't, which aren't the, uh, aren't for everyone. A few, a few. It's it's a bit claustrophobic, but it is an experience if you do want to do that. Um, one thing I would say about is family and connecting rooms in Japan are quite difficult to find. So if you're travelling with a family and want your rooms to be connected or or be in one room it's it's better to plan in advance because there's not that many rooms um boutique hotels don't really exist in japan they tend to be big um western style hotels um but the traditional inns you can class them as boutiques so you're not going to find boutique hotels as in the, as you would in europe but at least there's plenty of traditional options in japan that you can look into um, what about the price, the elephant in the room? Japan's not the cheapest destination and when you add up the accommodation, the flights, the transport, the guiding, the experiences, but the actual day-to-day -day costs in Japan are not that expensive. So a soft drink, 90 pence, a subway journey, one to two pound, bowl of ramen, five pound. In London, you'd pay 15 pounds for that. Um, a lot of green tea is free in restaurants. Um, temples, two to four pound to get in shrines are usually free to get in so the actual day-to-day -day costs in japan are not that expensive it's just the hotels and everything packaged up together that's that's where the expenses come from and there's absolutely no tipping in japan it's not part of their culture they don't expect it they'll give you the money back if you try to do it so that's another thing to keep in mind you're not going to have to spend as much as you think on the ground and there's no tipping to factor in into your spending money as well Another concern people have is I don't speak Japanese. Um, 
that's not a problem. A lot of signs in Japan have um, English translations underneath in all the main train stations. It's only really when you get out to the more rural places that the signage tends to drop off. Um, and one minute, let me just. I'm going to unmute you now. So if anybody does want to chip in, please do. So Japanese language, this is the Japanese um, character um, for Nin, um, which the characters are meant to represent what, um, what it looks like. So this is the character for one minute. For person. So and this is the character for Yama. Can anybody guess what that is? Cricket stubs. Cricket stubs? No. Yes. So that's yes. ma that's mountain. Um, and this is key. Can anybody guess what key is? House. Woman. It's tree. And Mura is forest. A wood. And Mori <laughs> is a forest. So it is quite logical when you start building up the characters and the standard Japanese. Then he is fire and then finally we have got hanabi which means flower fire can anybody guess what flower fire means oh. awesome mm -hmm. so it's fireworks fire flower um, um, so it, it, when you start learning japanese it is quite logical and it is quite interesting to look into it all Right, I'm just going to unmute everyone now. Um, and let's get Charlie back. Okay, so why would you choose to travel with us? We get fantastic feedback on our, our trips from our customers. Um, all of our staff have lived and worked in Japan, so we know the destination inside out. We've got our own office in Nagoya and Tokyo, so we're in full control of the trips. We're dealing with it all. We're not using another company in Japan. It's all us doing it. Um, we've got two types of travel. We've got small group tours, which are usually 14 people. We've only got one tour, which has got 20 people on it. Um, you get a full-time tour leader. They range from eight to 14 nights. We've got 12 different tours to choose from and departures go from February through to November. The guys you can see down below, that's our tour leaders. Um, they're fantastic. They speak fluent Japanese. Um, they live in Japan. They know the destination inside out. Um, and I went on one of our group tours 10 years ago, even though I'd lived in Japan and speak Japanese. I learned so much and eat some, ate some of the best food I've ever eaten because they really do know where to go and, and where away from the crowds and away from where all the usual tourists are. Somebody's coming back in. Um, and then our tours, we've got um, Essential, which is budget to three star, Classic is three star, All Inclusive is four star and Superior is five star. Um, and last year, um, Wanderlust magazine had an award ceremony for the best guides around the world. And Brett, one of our tour leaders, won the top tour leader uh, award. And that was voted for by Wanderlust custom um, readers. So we're very proud to have one of the best tour leaders in the world. Just to give you an idea of prices, so essential tour for about two weeks. These prices don't include um, flights. You have to add flights on top of that. We can do that for you. Um, so about two and a half thousand per person for one of our cheaper two week tours. Classic is then three star. So that's about four thousand pound per person. All inclusive is four star with all your entrance fees, all your meals, everything included. That's five and a half grand per person. And then superior is four to five star. And that's about six grand per person um, from prices. Um, and there are single supplements if you're traveling solo. So that's just to give you an idea of cost, but we do have other tours in between those prices if, if that's not quite suited to you. And then we've got self-guided adventures. So this is traveling around Japan independently by yourself. 
Um, so we might arrange all of your accommodation, your transport and guides in certain places, but, the, but getting from destination to destination, you're navigating the trains by yourself. We can do it budget right up to deluxe any time of the year and literally to any destination you want to go across Japan. We've got great guides all over the country who are there to help you out, maybe for a day in Tokyo, a day in Kyoto. And we've got experiences. If you've got a certain interest that you want or an experience you want to do, the likelihood is we can find something to match your interest or, or, or what something in particular you really want to do. When you are traveling with us independently like this, we provide you with your own little info pack, which has got your day-to-day -day itineraries, contact details for our office in Nagoya, our customer support team. They're only a phone call away if you have any problems, issues, questions, want to book a restaurant, they're there for you the whole time. Um, then instructions day by day, who's gonna be picking you up if you've got a transfer, what a picture of your guide, what, what where they're gonna meet you, what time they're gonna meet you, what time you're gonna what you're gonna do that day. If you've got trains, we give you train journeys in English and Japanese. So if you get to a station and don't know what you're doing, point someone will know what train you're trying to get on. Um, and the same again, accommodation in English and Japanese with maps. There's a general information section, so language, etiquette, ordering food in a restaurant, everything you need to know. And then each city you go to, we give you a destination guide with all our sightseeing tips, restaurant recommendations, bars, things like that. And then a few days in your trip, we'll also give you a quick phone call to see if you're doing okay and if there's any problems or if there's anything we can help with. So we really do make sure, even if you're traveling independently, that you're given as much support so that you can enjoy yourself, you're not getting lost and it runs like clockwork. 70% um, of our customers travel independently like this. So travel in Japan is nothing to be worried about. It's safe, everything runs on time. It's very straightforward and easy. And Japanese people, if they can't speak to you in English and don't know how to explain how to get to your hotel, they'll grab you by the hand and walk you 20 minutes out of their way just to get you there. That's how nice they are. So I'm quickly going to zip through nine nights in Japan, what you can expect from um, expect from nine nights. Golden route is the classic sightseeing route that you've got on the main island. So it starts three nights in Tokyo, two nights in Hakone, and then three nights in Kyoto. Um, and that's a good basis to start any trip. And then you can add on extra destinations around that. So day one, you'll arrive in Tokyo, maybe a private transfer into the city maybe stay in the Park Hotel, which is a great four-star um, hotel in the center of, of, of Tokyo. This is a special art room. Not all the rooms are this brightly decorated. They do have some normal rooms as well. Um, then you'll receive a package from our Japan office and it will have all your tickets with all of the um, explanations and translations into English so you know what each ticket is for. Then go out, start exploring Tokyo by yourself on the public transport using the card that we give you. Maybe go to the Shibuya Crossing, go to Meiji Shrine which is the most um, prestigious shrine in Tokyo and quite often you see weddings taking place here. Outside the shrine you've got Harajuku which is the crazy pop culture it, uh, district of um, Tokyo, lots of people in crazy outfits. And on a Sunday, you can see the, the dancing Elvises who are there every Sunday um, dancing to, uh, to rock music. Maybe go for dinner, you can go for ramen or these, this couple here are eating okonomiyaki, which is a savory pancake that you cook on, um, on, a, on a hot grill in front of you. And then back to the Park Hotel in the evening, um, and you can see just in the background there, this is a view from the Park Hotel. You can just see Mount Fuji in the shadows there. Day two, you've got a day with a private guide. This is Masa. He'll take you around Tokyo for the full day. Maybe go to Hamariku Gardens, stop in that little tea house for some green tea, and then take the water boat from the gardens up to Asakusa, which is the traditional district of Tokyo, where you've got Sensoji Temple, the most famous temple in Tokyo. Then after that, maybe go up the Tokyo Sky Tree, the world's largest telecommunications tower, and you get great views out over the city on the clear day. That evening, 
one of our tour leaders might come and meet you and take you for a night out in Tokyo, um, take you down the back alleys to all their favorite little restaurants in Izakaya, um, where you can try yakitori, so these chicken skewers. Um, and it is really fun. It's quite daunting going out all these back alleys by yourself. So having someone show you around and take you on a little food tour is a really fun way to explore the city. Um, and you'll find Japanese people, they can't speak English during the day, but once they've had a few beers inside them, they've got a bit of Dutch courage and then their English starts flowing out. And it's actually really fun going out in Tokyo in the evening. People are so friendly and they want to talk to you. Day three, you've got a free day to do whatever you want. Maybe a sushi breakfast at Tsukiji Fish Market or maybe a day trip to Kamakura. Um, which is about 40 minutes from um, Tokyo by train where you've got this big bronze Buddha on the coast or two hours north of Tokyo you've got Nikko which is World Heritage Shrine Complex, Shrines and Temples where they see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil monkeys come from or if you've got a family you might want to go to Tokyo Disney World or the Ghibli Animation Museum, there's plenty of options to do on your free day. Day four you're then on the bullet train down to Hakone, it takes about 40 minutes from Tokyo maybe staying at the Motoyu Kansu Iru, which is a lovely traditional inn in Hakone. Um, so you'll stay in a room like this. Um, and what I was saying earlier about the hot springs, if you are willing to pay a bit extra for your traditional inns, you can find traditional inns where you've got your own private hot spring bath in a little garden or on the balcony, and that avoids having to get naked in front of other people. Um, go out exploring in Hakone National Park. Um, you've got a great outdoor sculpture museum with lots of world famous artists. Then in the evening you're back for your dinner at the Ryokan and this is the kind of meal that they will serve. Um, so this is why dietary requirements are really important because there are so many different dishes, so many different things going on um, and they serve the same meal to every customer. Um, so that's why we need to know what 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 dietary requirements you may have but it's a fantastic experience great to have maybe two or three nights during your trip but I wouldn't recommend it for every night for your trip because eating this kind of meal every night it can get a bit too much and then sleep on futons in the evening laid out on the floor next day day five you've got a you can explore the national park um, uh, so this is a wakadani where they extract all the hot springs for the um, rear can and they've got black eggs um, that they cook in the water there and they turn black from the sulfur um, and then get a cable car down to Lake Ashi and this is why most people go to Mount Fuji. You can get great views out over um, the lake if the weather is clear but a word of warning the weather is not always clear in Hakone and quite often you can't see anything at all it's just clouds covering Mount Fuji. Day six on the bullet train back down to Kyoto, about two hours from Hakone. Um, Kyoto is a big modern city. Um, people are quite shocked when they do get there, but it is a um, it is the historical cultural capital of Japan. So even though it's a big modern city, there are pockets of tradition and culture throughout the city. Maybe stay in a machia, one of these traditional renovated townhouses. I think Charlie stayed in one of these when he was there. Um, and then start exploring Kyoto by yourself. Day seven, you've got a private guide for the day. This is Kiono san um, and she'll take you around Kyoto for the day. If you've watched the um, Paul Hollywood Eats Japan program, actually Kiono san who is our private guide, she doesn't work for any other company. Um, she took Paul Holly Hollywood around and showed him food. So um, she is really one of the best guides in this region. Um, go see the Golden Pavilion, Ryoanji Rock Garden, Arashiyama Bamboo Grove. You can have an off private afternoon tea with a geisha. There's so much to see and do in Kyoto. You could spend weeks here and not see everything. Uh, Fushimi Inari Shrine with all these red Tori gates leading up to the shrine at the top of the mountain. And then day eight, you can make a day trip from Kyoto. You can go to Nara, which is 40 minutes away. Nara was another ancient capital, so you've got fantastic, amazing temples. Or in Osaka, about 40 minutes from Kyoto, you've got bright lights, street food, um, and every March they have a sumo tournament. <coughs> or Himeji is about an hour and a half away by train, and you've got one of Japan's largest original castles there. And then day nine, it's pretty much up to you what you want to do. 
Um, you can head down to Hiroshima and Miyajima. So obviously where Hiroshima, the first atomic bomb was dropped, you've got the Peace Park a Museum. People are often don't really want to go. They think it's going to be depressing. The city itself is very vibrant, young and, and a very welcoming place. The Peace Park is really well done and lots of school kids go there for school trips and they'll practice their English with foreigners visiting. So there's a nice atmosphere. Um, but the, the museum itself is very, very heavy and very, very upsetting. Um, so what we recommend is you visit Hiroshima as a, as a sightseeing day trip, but then in the evening head over to Miyajima Island, which is just off the coast of Hiroshima and spend a couple of nights here in a traditional inn relaxing. Or you could go up to Kanazawa, up in the north of the Japan Alps, known for beautiful gardens and samurai culture. Or you've got Shirakawago, which is this UNESCO World Heritage um, town with all of these thatched roofs. And you can stay in one of these little thatched roofs farmhouses with a family. Or Takayama, which is in the Japanese Alps, and it's famous for crafts and sake brewery. So you can do a little sake brewery tasting tour and things like that. Or Mount Koya down south of Kyoto um, is a big temple complex where you can stay in temple lodgings. Um, really, really atmospheric and very cool. Or down south again to Mount Koya is the Kumano Kodo, which is a um, pilgrimage route. Lots of shrines and temples and you hike day to day to your accommodation and you forward your luggage on in advance. Spectacular scenery like this and really, really, really beautiful. So there's literally lots you can see and do in Japan. Um, if you're doing a 14 night trip, I'd say our best of Japan trip is a good place to start. Budget trips start around £2,000 per person plus flight. Classic three star around £3,000 per person. And then right up to deluxe can cost you £10,000 per person. So we, we, can, we can mix and match and we can do whatever you want based on your budget. Um, nothing is set in stone. We'll work it out to what you want. If you want lots of private transfers, we can do that. If you don't want any private transfers, we can take them all out. It's basically whatever you want. Um, and that's it. We can basically do anything. Um, I'm really sorry. I think I've gone longer than the half an hour we were expected. Really sorry about that. Um, a little update about coronavirus in Japan. Um, they've got a population of 127 million um, and they've had 907 deaths as of today. Um, so they're dealing with it a lot better than the UK is. Um, and considering that their population is aging and they've got I think they've got 71,000 people over the age of 100 in Japan. Um, their population is aging. There is far more older people than there are younger people. So there's more people at risk in Japan, yet they've had a very, very low um, death rate. Um, and that's down to tracking and tracing it. And um, Japanese people are very good at sticking to rules and doing what they're told. And they didn't need a full lockdown. It was more just be aware of what you're doing and don't make any unnecessary trips. So they've dealt with it very, very well in Japan. And as, as a company, currently, if customers are wanting to book a trip for next year, we're saying you can book a trip um, and you can cancel free of charge up to 60 days before you travel, um, just, just to give you some peace of mind, because I know it is a worrying time to think about, shall I pay for, commit myself to a trip for, for next year or not, we've got this guarantee at the moment, um, but this guarantee will not last forever. So when you're speaking to Charlie and planning a trip, make sure it's still in place or it isn't, it's still in place because it might not be there in a, maybe a month or two. And that's basically it. Um, so yeah, please do go to Charlie with any questions and if you do want to start planning a trip. Um, and does anybody have any questions now? Let me just unmute everyone. Sorry. Can I just jump in there then? I'll just jump in there, Matt, quickly. The um, that was fantastic, brilliant. It's um, yes, it was such good, such great pictures and and great, you know, great, great, great brings back great memories. So much to see and do there. Just just two things for me quickly. Often when people first speak to us about Japan, they automatically assume they want to do a group tour because of the security of the group. The self guided method that Matt talked about is just brilliant. It's it's such a good way of seeing the country and having it all taken care of. Um, but you've got the flexibility and independence if you want. So so yeah, the groups are great. The, the self-guided independents work fantastically. And 
I, I, I probably my particular highlight other than the sumo and staying on Miyajima was those rear calm stays. I think I just can't overemphasize what, what a great experience they are, that the personal service, the personal touches in the rear cans and those wonderful, wonderful uh, banquet keiseki meals you had for, for dinner and also for, for, for breakfast, because that's included on rear cans most of the time. Yeah, you know, our dinner, and it's, it's done on a, on a, on a half-board basis. And they, they're just wonderful experiences that the rear cards. So sorry, any, any questions for, 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 for Matt or myself on, on, on anything there? Hi, Charlie. Hi, yeah. Uh, can you... Hi, it's Teresa here. Can you just Hi, yeah. tell me what you're doing, you four are doing in that picture with the red <laughs> cars? <laughs> I, I, well, it used to be called Super Mario Kart, so I'm not sure they're allowed to. Um, no, uh, there's to been a lawsuit from Nintendo, so it's now. I think it's Super Kart. It's called now, and it's it's Super. in no no way related to Nintendo at all. So oh, this Hollywood is a, a, a two hour too. go kart ride around the center of Tokyo. I mean, we are talking up Bond Street, down Piccadilly, up Park Lane. You know, right through the center of of all the main sites. Um, dressed as looks unfortunate as, as superhero characters um street street level guide to to what's going on in the center of tokyo it was great fun um, um we did we did have someone showing us around in front of us but um yeah it was it was a brilliant way to explore the city and 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 and, and steer and that was a definite highlight yeah i think i know someone who'd like that yeah it, you know you, you've got the shrines you've got the the, the, the art you've got the culture you've got the fun stuff like this i mean we we, we spent time we, we caught one of the sumo tournaments uh we saw a baseball match which is i guess six months of the year you can get baseball mat is that right yeah it's, it's quite a lot months. yeah um the, the sumo is is there's only six tournaments a year three in three in tokyo and three elsewhere so it's it's pot luck if you're going to be there for those days and, and that was an amazing experience um but it's that mixture of, of classic Japanese things, the sort of the, 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 the gimmicky go-karts, the, 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 the temples, the food, you know, there's, there's such variety for families, non-families, solo travellers, all ages, as, as Matt said. Can I ask a question, Charlie? Is it, is it gay friendly? Yes, so um, yeah. I, I'm gay myself. Um, uh, yes, it, it, it is gay friendly. Um, uh, it's the weird thing about Japanese culture is that um, they're not affectionate in public anyway. So even a heterosexual couple walking down the street holding hands, they might or kissing each other, they might be a bit, oh, you don't do that in public. So it, 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 they're quite a reserved country. And they also don't speak about their private lives a lot in public. Um, but it's, it, it is a gay friendly country. Um, it, it, and at Dating back years and years and years and years, the samurai were quite well known for having gay relationships and things like that. So um, it's it yeah, it's totally fine to travel in. Japan. So it's not an issue in the in the accommodation at all. No, nobody no, gets, no, no. Um, I travelled with my partner in October and we had no problems at all. Um, and if 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 they accidentally give you a twin room rather than a double room just explain it to them and they'll go oh right we'll sort that out it, 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 it's not an issue at all um, but yeah anyone regard, regardless of your sexual orientation just don't start kissing each other in public and things <laughs> like that because it's just not the done thing in Japan. Oh, thank you. Thanks Brad. Any other questions there? Okay I mean Matt, I mean, you, I mean, the other one, the other one is, I guess, again, is the idea of, and you did sort of talk about, I mean, the, you know, there's a, there's a theory that, you know, if you don't go in March and April, you're really missing out. You, you, you were quite clear in your mind that you thought autumn, if anything, was, was, was a better time to go. Yeah, I, I absolutely love autumn. I was there last for the October Rugby World Cup and it, it was, it was, the weather was still fairly warm in the day, so it wasn't that cold, and the autumn leaves were fantastic. Um, I was I was there. It was like start of November is when the autumn leaves really started coming into their full their own. Um, 
but yeah, I, I, I love it at that time of year. Um, cherry blossoms can be a bit busy with all the Japanese tourists as well as the foreign tourists. Um, they, did, but, they did have that terrible storm, didn't they, though, in the Rugby World Cup? Is that unusual? Uh, that storm was because I was out there for a conference as well and a lot of people at the conference who'd never been to Japan were saying oh there's a big storm coming and I'm so used to Japan and their typhoons and their typhoons are it's usually a, by the time it reaches the mainland it's just a bad storm it's it's nothing that bad so I kept telling everyone don't worry about it it's going to be fine we, we deal with this all the time turns out to be one of the biggest storms they've ever had and I, I really regret telling everyone it was going to be okay um, but Japan being Japan, they're well set up for it. They deal with it. The next day, life was back to normal. Um, so if you're going to be anywhere where there's a storm or an earthquake, Japan is the place to be because they're well prepared for it and they know exactly what they're doing. Um, but yeah, it was a bit hectic um, trying to get on a train at five o'clock in the morning before they stopped all the trains. So um, I made it to the Wales match in the end, though, so it was fine. <laughs> That's all right then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. That was really interesting, Sophie. Here, um, it sounds like a fantastic destination for a holiday. And um, um, yes. may want well, on to Charlie to to talk about the possibility of that next year. Yeah, Charlie's got some great blogs on his website as well about his uh, family trip to Japan last year. So if you do mm. want to read those, uh, look them up. Lovely. Yeah, I might do. My family's quite yeah, similar it's just, to Charlie. It's just a wonderful so. destination, and um, and there's some for everyone i think that's what i keep keep saying I think thank they you that that's great carpet. thank you so much for the webinar it was really really helpful a great introduction to the country Absolutely. thank you sorry it's taken so long <laughs> guys thank thanks very much. thank you really good thank you thank you thank you thanks so thanks. much thanks everyone for coming along um keep your eyes open the next few weeks we've got a few more coming up we've got british columbia in, in two weeks time on the thursday the 18th uh, the event, we'll put it out on Facebook and, and Twitter and, and the marketing emails. And Matt, thank you once more. That was absolutely brilliant. Thanks so it much. It was. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Oh, I'm glad we did that. <laughs>